Hello all and welcome to this sixth lunch break webinar. My name is Bas Hoxberger and I'm Architectural Market Manager at Faros and I'll be your host today to welcome you um, and to support where required. My colleague Ryan Sainsbury, Technical Project Specialist at Faros will be the, uh, today's presenter. At the bottom of your screen, you will see um, a Q&A button. In here, you can type any questions and we'll try to answer it as soon as we can. Um, and there's the chat button as well to ask any other type of questions. Um, we don't have any poll today, so I would say let's get started. Um, these are today's topics. And with this, I'd like to uh, invite you, Ryan, to take over. Hello, Baz. Thank you very much for that. Hi, guys. Uh, so, yeah, as Baz said, my name's Ryan. I'm the technical project specialist for Faros Controls. Um, today's webinar is going to be a little bit different from the previous webinars. If you didn't manage to check out any of the previous webinars, by the way, you can do so by going to faroscontrols.com and uh, just checking out the previous subjects. So as I said, today's is gonna be a little bit different. Um, the previous subjects that we've looked at, uh, we've gone into one area in specific detail, but today's webinar is gonna be looking at designer in a little bit more of a generalized view. And specifically, we're gonna be looking at the best practices that you should be using when building a project file within designer. So effectively, there are three parts to this. Um, we want to give you the ability to organize your project file, which is really, really important. Obviously, you know, it goes without saying a really clear and concise project file is going to make any kind of troubleshooting that you have to do a lot easier. If you have to come back to a project file after say 18 months and you need to do some updates to a programming, um, of course, just jumping into that show file, having things laid out in a clear and concise way can really help. And then also if you're working with different um, team members as well, working in a standardized uh, kind of way will of course just help everyone understand what's going on. Some other things that I want to look at as well is simplifying the programming within your show file um, just to make things more efficient and to save you some time and improve your workflow. And finally, there's some just general best practices that we want to look at as well. So I'm going to start off uh, by uh, looking at uh, designer first. Um, I'm just going to quickly um, share my screen. We are experiencing one or two technical difficulties with OBS today, by the way. Uh, so, Baz, I'm just going to quickly ask you, is my uh, uh, designer open? Can you see it? Yes, it all looks good. Um, and if people want, they might be able to um, adjust Zoom in such a way that your video will be on top. Uh, reach out to me via chat if you need help doing that. But um, the quality of the designer sharing is good today. Okay, thank you very much for that, Bas. Okay, so first thing I want to jump into is looking at something called version control. Now, I'm pretty sure that most of you are using this anyway, um, but it's important that uh, we just uh, kind of go over the importance of why uh, this is a really, really useful thing to, for you to be using within your project files. So what is version control and why should you use it? Well, very simply, if you're saving your programming into uh, the sh same show file over and over and over again, if you do run into any issues, uh, that's going to make it a lot, lot harder because you're going to have to trawl through all of your previous programming uh, to get to the point where, where the mistake happened or, or, or something uh, went wrong. So by saving a version regularly every single time you do a new bit of programming uh, it's very simple if a mistake or some kind of error should happen uh, for you just to jump into your previous version open it up give it a quick test if it works brilliant then you know obviously between version 1.3 and 1.4 that something's broken and you don't have to trawl back through all of your programming so there are one or two things within designer uh, that can help you with this First of all, you can save a, a fresh show file by hitting save project as new. This will save a completely fresh show file. And of course, you can adjust uh, the name to something like 1.4, 1.3 to uh, signify what version you're on. Um, I also like to give a date as well. I think that's quite important. So obviously, you know, uh, when the last time the file was opened. And then within designer, you have this notes view as well. And again, I always like to have the version, I like to have the date, and then I just have to have, like to have some basic notes, uh, which will help me understand what I've done in that version. And of course, as I said before, <clears throat> if you need to jump back to a previous version, uh, you can look at what you've done in that file, and that should make your troubleshooting process a little bit easier. Okay, 
So the next thing I want to jump into is the layout view. And specifically, I want to look at something that's going to be a recurring free theme throughout today's webinar. And that's by uh, using something called number ranges. So in the left hand corner, I have all of my groups. So for instance, I have all of my downlights, and then I have my spotlights, some linear fixtures and chandelier fixtures, stairs, etc. What you should notice is that all of my downlights are grouped into a 100 range. My spotlights are in a 200 range, my linear fixtures are in a 300 range, and so on and so forth. So the obvious benefit of doing this is that you're keeping your uh, groups of fixtures organized, um, and that you know obviously can make it very easy. Um, uh, it can make it very easy to tell what group you're specifically working with. So I know that if I'm selecting a, a group of fixtures that's within a hundred range, I'm going to be looking at my downlights. Likewise, if I'm looking at a fixture group that starts in 500 range, that's going to be one of my stairs. That's the first benefit. But the second benefit as well is it's very easy to tie these in with other parts of your programming. So for instance, if I've got a slider that controls the master intensity of a group, I can label that slider slider 501 and it's very easy for me then to link that uh, to my, um, my group of fixtures that I'm talking about. So there's a couple of different benefits there. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on how you can use number ranges because as I said, it applies to multiple things. It's not just groups. You can use it with timelines, scenes, buttons, sliders, color pickers, and it can, again, just improve your workflow, but we'll come onto that later. The other thing that I always like to do when I'm working with the layout view, once I've completed my layout, I uh, always go to the bottom right hand corner here and check the locked button. I have a MacBook Pro that has a very sensitive uh, trackpad and sometimes I'll be working uh, on a fixture layout and then things will start moving around um, just by accident. Uh, specifically if you're working with VLC and VLC plus layouts where you're working with you know a high number of fixtures this can be really useful just making sure that all of your fixtures are locked so that you can't accidentally move them and uh, lose their position. Okay, so uh, what I want to do now is I want to have a quick look at some of the best practices to use within the mapping view. Now, I could talk uh, about you know how to build pixel matrices or content targets, um, but I really feel that that's too big a subject for today's webinar. Instead, I want to look at something uh, that's come up very recently, uh, which is the uh, best practices for um, using media uh, within designer. Again, a lot of the things that I'm talking about today are, are common requests that I get from customers. So I've kind of just packaged that all in today's webinar just so that I can give you this information. But as I said, um, specifically, I want to look at the best practices uh, for mapping media and how you should actually uh, import your media content and, and how that should be generated. So I've got a 16 by 32 pixel matrix here, and uh, effectively that's its resolution. Now, given this is actually quite a small pixel matrix, you'll probably be working with a lot larger size uh, within uh, your your day-to-day -day programming. But for today, that's the kind of resolution that we're going for. Over on the right hand corner, I have a bit of media and hopefully you'll be able to see that there are some numbers just underneath the title. The first thing that I want to look at is this resolution here. Generally speaking, as a rule of thumb, when you're generating media content for your pixel matrices or your content target, it's generally recommended that you map a pixel to a fixture. And what I mean by that is if you've got a resolution of 16 by 32, or 240 by 100, you should be producing media content that is not only that aspect ratio, but also maps pixel for pixel. I suppose this kind of you know goes without saying, there's no point in generating high definition 1080p uh, media content when you're going to map it to a pixel matrix that's a lot, lot smaller. In fact, what you'll see is that you have a spinning uh, wheel up in the right hand corner and that's just designer basically processing and scaling down that media content so that it can be correctly mapped to your pixel matrix. So as I said, first things first, make sure that your aspect ratio is the same as your uh, pixel matrix and try and map a pixel of your media to a pixel of your pixel matrix, effectively making the media content the same resolution as the pixel matrix. The next thing that we've got as well that I want to look at is the frames per second FPS. So generally speaking, not always, but generally speaking, media content is produced at 24, 25 frames a second. You can produce media content at a higher frame rate, but generally speaking, most frame rates that you get with media content are 24, 25 frames a second. 
DMX has a slightly higher refresh rate. It's about 33 hertz or 33 cycles per second. So in order for you to get the best out of the protocol, it's generally recommended that you produce media content that, has, that is at a slightly higher frame rate. So we're talking something like somewhere between 33 and 35 frames a second. And that's going to ensure that you just get the best transitions between your fades and between your color changes. And ultimately, uh, it's going to get you uh, the, the best result. Next thing as well is the uh, bit depth, which is over to the far right hand side. Um, it's displayed in megabits. This is quite a complex subject when you talk about video, but eventually, uh, but effectively, it's the amount of uh, color information that you have in your video, the amount of dynamic range as well. As a just general rule of thumb, uh, if you're working at something around 360p, you want to be using a, um, a bit rate of about one megabit. And then uh, if you're using a resolution of 1080p, then you want to be going up to about five megabits. But you don't really want to be going any higher than five megabits. So there's a kind of a sliding scale, one megabit of 360p up to five megabits at 1080p. But you don't want to go higher than that. Again, uh, you know, DMX just doesn't have that resolution, uh, or not that resolution, DMX doesn't have that um, amount of information when compared to video. So you don't need to use really, really high megabit rates. And then finally, uh, just to look at some of the file types that we use, um, they're all listed in our help under uh, the reference under mapping, um, uh, and then you'll see that there's media presets. But generally speaking, .mov, uh, MPEG2, AVI, any of those uh, common file formats should work in Designer. If you're unsure, .mov is typically the one that I go and use, and that'll be absolutely fine uh, when you uh, import that into Designer. Okay, so I think that's it for the mapping window. Uh, I'm going to come over to the patch window now. <clears throat> so um, one of the things that I would quickly like to show you is just um, adjusting the DMX refresh rate. This isn't all, always necessary, but people often do ask me this question and I can never find it in the patch window because it's, it's not actually in here. Uh, but generally speaking, when you're dealing with DMX refresh rates, you, you tend to keep it on the normal mode, which is here. And of course, uh, that will then just give you the standard 33 hertz, um, which will um, just yeah give you the standard DMX refresh rate. The uh, low refresh rate is 22 hertz, and the high refresh rate is 44 hertz. Just remember, if you are going to use the high refresh rate of 44 hertz, you're going to need to make sure that your fixtures can actually produce that in order to um, have that um, uh, successfully output on your fixtures. Sometimes if you're using high refresh rate and your fixtures can't quite support it, you may run into issues. But generally speaking, just keep it at normal and you should be fine. One other thing that I want to look at is uh, the limitations uh, that people often ask me about when uh, broadcasting um, ArtNet. So ArtNet differs from DMX in that ArtNet is uh, sent over a network, so it's a form of eDMX, um, and there are certain things that um, you should probably bear in mind when using ArtNet. Now, specifically, when we're transmitting ArtNet, we have three typical modes that come within Designer. There's automatic, always broadcast, and unicast, and they work in slightly different ways. Automatic will send out something called an art poll request. This is a effectively a discovery mechanism. Once it sends out this art poll request, any um, nodes that meet the ArtNet specification should reply with a art poll reply. And this just simply tells the controller, okay, I'm sitting in this IP address and I want this universe or these universes. As soon as we get that information back, we will then unicast. If we fail to get back any information uh, from a node that we have a specific universe for, we'll then switch it to a broadcast mode. So that brings me quite nicely onto the second mode, which is always broadcast. So if we fail to get an art poll reply, as I said, we'll switch to broadcast, but you can force a universe to broadcast. What this simply means is the universe is sent out on a broadcast address. What that then means is the nodes that are sitting on the network that are receiving the ArtNet will then have to interrogate the packet to decide whether or not it wants to use that in universe. So if we sent out a universe of 10, and let's say that we have, uh, I don't know, five different nodes, they'll all have to look at that universe and decide whether or not they want to use it. Now there is a slight uh, downside to this, which is if you're sending out a high amount of universes that are being broadcast, of course, each one of your nodes is going to have to look into the uh, ArtNet 
uh, packet. They're going to have to decipher whether or not they want that universe. And effectively, that means that they're going to be using up a lot more processing. It's for this reason that we generally recommend that you don't broadcast more than 30 universes, because if you broadcast more than 30 universes, you may tend to see some playback issues. Obviously, your nodes are going to be working really hard to process all the universes on the network. And of course, uh, that can then um, potentially uh, cause issues with their processing power and that could potentially uh, lead to bad output in the fixtures. So generally, no more than 30 universes should be broadcast. Also, just one other thing as well, we have the unicast mode. This is very simple. This is where you can effectively sign an IP address to a universe. Obviously, I can type in the IP address here and then that universe is going to be sent directly to that node. Furthermore, up in the protocol options, uh, the protocol properties, you have uh, a couple of different options. You can disable broadcast altogether. You can disable art poll. And there's also something called art sync as well, which you can enable or disable. Okay. Okay, let's move on to the timelines. So as I said uh, previously, when I was working in the layout view, using number ranges is really, really important in designer, especially when you come to using timelines. So you'll notice that again, I've numbered all of my timelines uh, within the relevant ranges. So my downlights are in 100 ranges, my spotlights are in my 200 ranges, and of course my linear uh, fixtures are in my 300 ranges and so on and so forth. This is particularly useful because I can link a button press on the TPC uh, to uh, this timeline. The way that I'm going to be doing that is by using the button key. Okay, so what I do is I set my button key to something like button 101 then i can link that using our variable system to that timeline and i'm going to show you how to do that within the triggers view in a little while so don't worry I'll, I'll get onto that in a bit but effectively what i'm doing here is i'm setting a range uh of um so i'm setting my groups to be in a specific range the 100 range my timelines are then in a range that correlate to that and then finally any tpc buttons or sliders or color pickers will also have that range and that just makes it really easy i can reduce all my triggers down to just a couple of triggers i can use our inbuilt variable system and i can just link them automatically and again i'll show you how to do that in a little while one other thing that i explained in a previous webinar when i was looking at emergency systems is using the uh, groups uh, that can come with uh, the um, uh, timeline properties so if you go up to manage and you'll notice uh, that there is the ability to set a group uh, for that uh, timeline. So this is particularly useful if you want to use a release all action. Uh, so again, I've got all of my uh, timelines that are in uh, the 100 range, all of my downlight timelines, and I put those all into group A. So if I want to say, okay, I don't know what timeline's running, but I want to release all of them in this area specifically, you can put them into group A, and then later on in your programming, you can have a release all action that releases all timelines in group A. Again, I'll show you that as we move forwards, but it's just important just to show you how you actually set that. Again, I've done a similar kind of thing for my 200 ranges, my spotlights, I put those all into group B, my 300 ranges are into group C, my 400 ranges are into group D, and so on and so forth. And that's just going to allow me to compartmentalize all of my timelines into specific uh, groups, and then I can just simply say release all in group, uh, and that will obviously relate to a specific area. Very, very useful for zonal control. Okay, uh, so I want to move on to my interface now. I've got a very, very basic interface uh, set up for today. And there's just a couple of things that I want to show you here. The first thing I've already explained um, is just making sure that you have uh, the relevant button keys. So I've got all of my downlights into my 100 range. I've got all of my spotlights into my 200 range. And I've got all of my linear fixtures in the 300 range. And of course, that will then relate to the timelines. That will also then relate to uh, the groups that I've got. So I'm following that range all the way through my show file, all the way through my show file, whatever there's a downlight or anything to do with a downlight, it's always gonna go within a 100 range. Again, I'll show you how to make the use of that in your triggers in a little while. So one other things, a uh, couple other things that I wanna show you as well. Um, we have this option that I don't see a lot of people using to wrap words. As you can see, this, this middle button here, it doesn't have enough space to fit the full text on. Okay, so one thing I could do is I could obviously just reduce the font size. Okay, that's fine. Uh, but one other thing you can do as well 
is you can use the uh, wrap word feature down here. And I see a lot of people miss that out. As soon as you click that, that will automatically send, sense if there's uh, if it needs to drop a word onto um, the next line. There is also a way to do this automatically as well. If you if you look up the caption up the top right here, you notice I've got a backslash n, um, and that's just a, a little kind of shortcut to use as a um, as a new line. So if you just put in backslash n, you'll see on the interface that it just drops the word night down to the line. So you can kind of create breakpoints uh, within your text whenever you're doing something on the interface. So that can be really really useful if you're using a lot of words and you want to drop them onto different lines. And then finally, uh, one other thing that may save you a lot of time, it used to be uh, that you had to configure your pin code using your triggers, conditions, and actions. And now within Designer, uh, we just have an automatic pin code that will appear. Uh, you can set that up uh, via going to manage, just obviously enter in a key, and then you'll need to enter in a lock timeout. So I'll just put like 30 seconds. And after 30 seconds, it'll automatically take you to a keypad and the user will obviously then have to log in. You then obviously have the option to send them back to the previous page that they were on or just take them to the home page. So you don't even need to set up any triggers, conditions or actions where you did before. You can just use this. It'll automatically lock it like it would uh, with a phone or any other touchscreen device. Okay, let's come on to triggers. And I think this is the one that I really want to spend a little bit of time on um, because for me, this is kind of... The nuts and bolts, the brains of your programming, obviously it's really, really important to get this right. I, I do see a lot of customers sometimes, I wouldn't say struggling with this, but they send me their show files and they've got hundreds and hundreds of triggers. And I think there's such an easier way to program that. Or sometimes they'll send me their programming, but it's very, very complex and it's really, really hard to troubleshoot. So the first thing that I always like to do whenever I'm setting up my uh, show file is use um, spacings and color coding. So the color coding feature has been there in Designer for some time, but what you'll notice is I've color coded each different type of trigger with a different type of color. Really, really simple, very easy to organize your profiles, uh, your programming rather. So the time-based triggers in the left-hand corner are orange. I've then got a slider, which is just simply purple. I've got um, my touch button event triggers are set to green, but this is for you know launching timelines and then for stuff that's being turned off via touch buttons. Uh, so releasing areas, I've got then the triggers set to green and so on and so forth. Um, it just means that I can go straight into my project file and I know the difference between all of the triggers. Um, if you don't have any kind of color coding and your triggers aren't in any kind of order, when you look at it, it can be just really, really hard to understand. So it's also, it's quite important that you, you order them. Just be aware that when you do order them, if you do have two triggers that are exactly the same, the first trigger will fire. And then depending on whether or not if you have absorbed checked, uh, it will either keep looking down on that list or if you, oh, sorry, if you do have a resolve checked, it will stop looking down that list. Um, so yeah, just make sure that your triggers are ordered as you would like them, but try and keep them in some kind of grouping. And that takes me on quite nicely uh, to the last part, which is that we now have this IO module that is literally a separator. And again, this is really, really useful for just making sure that uh, everything is compartmentalized and really well organized. So you can see at the top here, I've got this spacer, and that's then obviously uh, signifying that these are my Astro and real-time triggers. I've then got another spacer, which is telling me this is for the brightness. I've got another one, which is for just in the touchpad control, and then so on and so forth. One for uh, building management system integration down at the bottom where, where I have those triggers that relate to that. You can do that really easily. Just go to the uh, modules uh, library, click on download uh, and then I believe it's under utilities and then you can see that there's one called separator. Um, you may also have this in your project file um, in your designer uh, version already uh, so if you do need to go to it then you can just normally look in the unused modules and then click on it and then it will just appear there. Uh, very very simple tool very very good for keeping your show file organized. Okay, so finally I just want to link uh, all of my button presses to my timelines now. And I'm going to do this using our variable system. So I was sent a show file a couple of days ago and the user, I think he had like, I don't know, it must have been about 
50 or maybe 60 sliders because he needed individual um, slider control and he had all of those triggers set up and you know very very uh, long list of triggers to link each slider to a group and I also had done the same thing for buttons where he had one trigger that was a button that linked uh, to a specific action to start a timeline. If you're using the ranges that I've been talking about quite a lot in this webinar, you really don't need to use that many triggers. So let me explain. Let's just quickly look at my downlights. So first of all, I've got a word that just simply signifies what area I want to look at. Okay, so down. But what you'll notice next to it is I have this uh, 3D capture in the button string key box. Okay. So if we quickly go back to the interface editor, you'll notice that all of my buttons have this down keyword and then they have the number after them. So 101, 102, 103, so on and so forth. So simply what happens here is when a button is pressed, the trigger will look for the button uh, key and it will then strip the last three numbers and it will then use that as a variable to start my timeline because of course my timelines if you remember have all got the same numbering system okay so 101 means timeline 101 which links to button 101 just so we're clear though the 3d uh open chevron 3d closed chevron it's called a wild card okay and that will match any three digits that it sees there and then capture that as a variable and that's why it's 3d if, for instance, I only wanted to capture two numbers, I would use 2D, a single digit would just be D. Okay, but because we want to capture a three digit range, that's why I'm using 3D. So any key that matches down and three numbers, it will grab that number, it will strip that number from, from the uh, button key, it will then turn that into a variable, and that will then allow me to pick any one of those timelines. So that would then effectively give me a range from 001 up to 999, and by doing that, I can really quicken up my uh, programming. I won't need to create a trigger that will match an action. Instead, I can use this variable system. It will strip that number from the button key and then it will say, okay, I'm going to use that as a variable to pick that timeline. And you're then very, very simply linking your uh, timeline numbers to your buttons. So there's a couple of other things that I've done here as well, just typical project file stuff. Uh, so I have used this uh, Oh, well, let me let me look at this another way. So what I've done down here at the bottom is I've then used a set control state action. This set control state action is going to illuminate uh, the button uh, on the TPC uh, that has just been pressed. So basically what it's doing here is it's simply just capturing that number and then it's using that to join that onto an, uh, the end of a key so that it can illuminate uh, that button key and turn it to green. So it's going to give you some user feedback as to uh, you know which button has just been pressed and then finally what it's going to do as well it's going to turn all of the other buttons back to their default state because you imagine if you don't turn the buttons back to their default state then of course when you click them they're all going to then just highlight green so you need to reset everything first and then of course uh, you're going to then need to highlight the button uh, that was just selected so you can basically say okay any any button that begins with the word down uh, match it and then you just simply do that using the star and then that will then obviously return that back to its default state okay so moving on to some of the other triggers as well that i've um that i've uh, put in here so at, at the bottom here i've got um some really simple uh bms integration or, or integration with a uh, an external device it could be anything really but i'm using my ethernet based triggers okay and likewise uh this is going to launch my my media clips so if i uh take you back to my timelines and i go up to the end you'll notice that i am looking for these timelines numbered one two and three okay and let's just say that we wanted to launch those from an external system so i can do that using uh, again another uh, string capture or, or variable capture and all I'm simply doing there is I'm using an Ethernet input trigger. I've got a keyword uh, that I'm going to match. And then again, just like before, as I showed you, we're going to strip the last number from that string. And then we're going to turn that into a variable, which is then going to go get a uh, timeline. So my my BMS system, the system that was integrating with us, uh, would be you know sending in a string of media one 
or media two or media three. We're simply capturing that last number and then we're going to use that to select a timeline uh, from uh, the selection that we've got. Again, I'm just linking numbers together. This is all that I'm really doing here. You will notice that I've got a backslash R afterwards. That's a terminating character. Um, that just basically clears the uh, controller's buffer. Um, it's really kind of important that you do that when 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 you're using string captures, especially um, because obviously you know you, you need to have an endpoint and start point so that you can strip the relevant information. And then finally, what I'm doing is I'm then just sending back a confirmation command back to the uh, control system or sorry the uh, BMS system. Again, you'll notice that my uh, IP address is set to variable one and my port number is set to variable two. That's because whenever we receive some kind of incoming uh, ethernet based command, the first and second variable that we'll get will be the IP address and the port number. So I can just use, reuse that information uh, by setting these to variable one, variable two. And then finally, uh, I've just got my uh, string capture at the bottom. This is going to capture the input number here and then just place it there in the string. And then I put ACK as like acknowledgement afterwards. And again, just a terminating character at the end of the string. So really, really simple way that you can integrate and, and speed up your programming without the use of scripting or anything complex. And of course, uh, you know, hopefully uh, by looking at some of these different uh, types of uh, systems and functions within Faros, uh, you can keep your project file more organized and of course uh yeah you can just then um quicken up your programming and uh improve your workflow okay uh but as i see we've got a couple of questions uh but i'm, I'm probably right about done here yeah I, I see one coming in uh shouldn't the variable for the timeline be another number here four i think um and i mm, this just came in um Shouldn't the variable for the timeline? Uh, I think if you click uh, in trigger number 21. Yeah. Because I, I, I think it's not, but I'm trying to understand the question for the ethernet input. Yeah. Because um, I think what Brian mentioned here all makes sense. Um, yeah, I'm trying to think. So we're, we're capturing we only need to capture one digit because the the timeline numbers are one, two, and three. So I just wanted to show you that you can you can adjust the uh, you can adjust the uh, length of that string capture. Start time for variable four. Ah, actually, no, it's not. It's variable three. Good shout. Yes, no, he is right. Apologies. Uh, you are correct. Variable one would be the IP address. A variable port would be the two. So variable, this would probably need to be variable number three. Uh, good, no. Um, good no it, will be, it will be put in front probably, but it's a fair point. And I guess uh, yeah. we are running a bit out of time, but this is where the log file typically comes in handy because this will tell mm. you where the different captures show. But um, you are right, Safe, that um, when you use Ethernet input, we capture more variables than only in the string because we will also capture the IP address and the port something is sent from. Yeah. Um, good. Yeah. Good question. So yes, it may be a different variable number. Yeah. Apologies for that. I I, I would need to test it to be sure. Um, I'm pretty sure it's one because I think always everything we capture in the string will be put in front of it, and afterwards we will get the base data. Okay, we'll we'll let you know. Uh, say we'll, we'll get back to you. <laughs> if if that if that is correct, then you what you might have to do is you might have to change that to variable two and that to variable three. Uh, okay. Well, yeah. I'll tell you what. Let, let's check and get that back to you. Yeah. Ryan, can you see the Q and A window? Because there's uh, three questions in there. Yeah, sure. One from Philip Christ on Trigger Twenty One. Uh, you are starting timeline for Variable One, but you say the IP address is for Variable One. Yeah, so I think we've just discussed that. So yeah, you would have to uh, check that uh, within the log. It will tell you in the log if you just open up the log. As soon as you receive an information, it will say Variable One, Variable Two, Variable Three, and then it's really, really obvious which one's the port, which one's the IP address, and which one's the uh, the timeline number or the or rather the incoming string. I think you are right in saying that yes, it certainly wouldn't be the same variable number uh but you can just simply check uh charles drew what is the best way to toggle a button state when the button toggles a timeline good question so we actually have 
So I'd probably go about that programming that in a slightly different way. We do have a action first of all to toggle the timeline, um, and of course, you know, if the timeline stopped, then uh, it will start playing, and obviously, if the timeline's already playing, that will start. St uh, it will stop. In that scenario, though, uh, a lot of the uh, feedback that you're using here wouldn't necessarily work because obviously you wouldn't want to make the button you've just selected go green if the timeline was already off. Um, so this is a little bit more advanced programming, uh, but typically what you could do um, is you can, well, it depends, yeah, it depends how you've got this set up but you can use a timeline started uh, trigger. You can set that to any, and then you can also do a uh, set control state. Uh, obviously, you know, you just pick your set of sliders. Your slider keys would have to be all the same, I think, for this to work. So it doesn't really work with the example that I've got set up, but again, you can do some kind of capture. Uh, and then you can have that set to green. And also you can use uh, then a release all trigger um, to, oh, so you use a release uh, or timeline release trigger. And again, you would just use the star. But this doesn't really work with the example that I've got because I've got slightly different button keys uh, that I've, that I've yeah. uh, set this up. This concept, though, is very powerful when you have multiple reasons why a timeline might start. For example, from an astronomical time or coming from an external system or because somebody pe uh, touches something on the touch panel, um, making your triggers, the fact that the timeline has started or the timeline has ended can be a great way to be sure that your buttons always stay in sync with, with what's actually happening. Yeah, yeah, totally. And I, I believe don't quote me on this, but I believe soon uh, the timeline started option that I've got up here may have the group, the, the timeline group attached to it. So obviously we have these timelines which then have, you know, a group attached to them. I believe coming soon, don't, don't, <laughs> don't ask me when, I don't know, uh, but you will also have like an option here. So it will be like if a timeline has started in group A, uh, then you can do this kind of variable capture. So then you can also uh, compartmentalize it, which can be particularly useful. Okay, let's have a look at some other trigger uh, options, uh, questions rather. Uh, is there a way to check the variables and corresponding numbers returned by each of the triggers within designer? Yeah, I mean, I think we've already, we've already talked about this, right? I mean, going to the log um, is is definitely going to be the best way to to do that so whenever you have a trigger that is producing some kind of variable if you go to the log set your log to debug mode it will tell you uh, you know in, in uh in order which variable is what so variable one will be some kind of string variable two ip address variable three a port number or something like that so if you want to check which uh which variables correspond to which number fire the trigger go into the log and it will tell you just make sure your log set to debug yeah the controller log yeah that's correct yeah the controller log in fact i'll tell you what if you really wanted to uh, why no unfortunately this is not available offline which is quite a good question no it's not available offline you, yeah it's only something that you can do uh with a controller because the controller needs to needs to process the uh trigger uh, but yeah, it's in the controller's log. Yeah, it's nice and easy to find. I don't think. Yeah, we'll, we'll follow up maybe with this afterwards. I know Ryan is now sharing a screen, but there were some computer issues just before this meeting. Hence, he is now not able to upload directly to the controller and show that. Um, mm. And rather than troubleshooting in this webinar, let us follow up after this meeting with you. I think that's probably easiest. Yeah. Does that work for you? Yep. Cool. All right, for me? Yeah, cool. Okay, brilliant. Okay, then I think because we are a bit overrunning, let me take over the screen and here we go. Um, fix this. I mean, you have all found the Q&A to type your questions, so all thank you for that. Um, this was our, thanks Ryan, of course, for doing your presentation. I know it was a bit of a technical challenge this time, but thanks for this. Um, after this webinar, you will receive a small survey and. Um, this is the last of the first six session of webinars we've done. We're now looking into um,
planning additional sessions. So your feedback for topics is very much appreciated, but also any type of other feedback, uh, as some of you put in the chat, it is really much appreciated to help us to um, uh, further fine tune the format. With this, um, I'll be ending the webinar. Uh, I'd like to thank you all for your attendance and I really hope to see you in next time.